in Zimbabwe, we ran into some new issues that I hadn't run into before. So we had large locusts uh, and grasshoppers that would come in and eat the center Cambrian layer of the plant. So they go up about a foot and a half, two feet high, eat all the bark off, and then the plants would just flop over, right? And it's like, what do you do against that? And there's, you know, we're getting overrun. And this all happened right when COVID hit the South Africa. So they immediately sealed all the borders with South Africa. And South Africa is where we, the only place we could import biocontrols from, right? So that we could use for resale in the Western markets because that was the goal was to export all of the flour. So we ha- basically got cut off from all of our supply and I'm getting overrun by bugs. So I call up Chris Trump and I was like, hey man, I'm kind of panicking. I don't know what to do right now. Can you give me some ideas on like something I can make? Because I am like cut off from the outside world. I can't import anything now because they have like a, you know, all the borders are shut now for bringing in anything because of COVID. And he told me about a method where he had, um, he did an IMO three to four. And in the brand, he had a bunch of weevils that had gotten into the brand and he inoculated it with this weevil brand, you know, infected brand. And what happened is the, the weevils got, uh, or, or flea beetles or whatever it was in there got, um, infected with the, uh, the fungi from the IMO that, that like to kill them, basically the wild equivalent of a Varia bassiana or Isaria fumisteraceae, um, that, or whatever it is, Cordyceps fumisteraceae. Now I think they just changed the name of it. Um, they're always changing the name of the biocontrols just to confuse the crap out of the pest control people, I swear to, uh, anyways, um, that they look like little popcorn kernels because they were covered in fungi. So he was like, hey, this works really good on the, the, the tr- macadamia nut trees for getting rid of the weevils. You know, we, we've kind of been screwing around with it, but I haven't had anybody to really test it on like a bigger scale. So we went ahead and I, we paid a bunch of the kids like like a nickel for every 10 or 20 grasshoppers they could find. And we had all the little village kids running around getting all the grasshoppers they could into buckets for us. And um, we took that. We did a bunch of IMO collections with IPMO. So this is the recipe for this. And it's something I think anybody doing gardening uh, should really, you know, adopt this practice because it's really, really good. It works on a really wide range of insects, grasshoppers, um, blister beetles, Japanese beetles, leaf hoppers, um, stink bugs, like a lot of stuff that's really hard to treat normally. Um, gra- caterpillars and, gra- uh, and butterflies works really good on these guys too. Um, it will kill your bees though if you spray them directly with it. It will infect them. So it won't take out your hive, but if you spray them and directly apply it um, onto the bees, it will kill them. So just make sure that maybe you apply them in the evening when the bees have already roosted. If you if you are keeping bees at home, just to be on the safe side, it's just a precaution on that. So, uh, if you're familiar with IMO, um, and we'll go through it and assume that you aren't, first you're going to weigh about 700 grams of rice and put that into a bowl. Next, you're going to take 300 grams of your locally collected insects or purchased insect frass, or go to your local pet shop or farm store and buy mealworms or crickets or some other local insect ish. Or take a light bulb and put it above a bucket outside and just let all the local bugs fall into it and strain that and just try to get about 300 grams of insect frass or bugs. Alternatively, you can use crab meal or lobster meal if you have to, uh, if you're in a pinch. Next, you're going to mix those two together until you have a nice uh, insect-infused rice mix. Then you're going to cook that together, combined, uh, in, a, in a pot until it's about 80 to 85% finished with the rice, till it's a little bit stiff still but not totally soft yet. Then you're going to take that finished cooked mix and you're going to put it into an open um, uh, open weave basket that has a lot of holes in it and air can flow through it really well. Uh, and you're going to put a good four or five inches layer uh, in the bottom of that basket. Then you're going to take a piece of uh, open screen uh, and it doesn't matter, any kind of screen will work. Or you can even just take a piece of string and weave it across the top. Um, you just need to make a cover for it that air can pass through, but you don't want to keep, let the local dogs or cats or squirrels or whatever else, forest creatures into it. Um, okay, so now you have your basket that has a little screen on top. Now you're going to take your basket full of uh, your, your starter, and you're going to put that out into the forest or a part of your property that has a lot of duff or leaf litter or, you know, a, an area where it's kind of naturally composting like you would in a forest. Um, the older the area that's uh, and the healthier the area, the better. You know, uh, I like to do a good, you know, 10 to 20 collections at a time when I do this because you can combine all of them and kind of get the different microbial colonies from around the different area. Uh, you're going to set that basket out uh, into your forested area, and then you're going to put a cover on top. So 
not directly on top of the basket, but, you know, a good foot and a half, two feet above it, you're going to put a, a plastic bag or an old dog food bag or a trash bag, whatever you can. It just keeps the rain from falling onto the rice. So the rice doesn't get any more wet, right? You just want to have it kind of like damp, but not soaking wet. Uh, then you're going to look around the forest and see if you can find any um, pieces of branches or anything that have a little um, uh, mycorrhizae on it and just drop two or three of those or, or, you know, four or five if you want to, into the top of your basket, just, uh, you know, underneath the screen so that you do have a little bit of an inoculant uh, going on there. Now, what's going to happen is uh, you're going to leave it out there for five days, you know, maybe six if it's a little bit cooler. If it's really hot, you can sometimes get away with four days, but usually five to six days is what it takes to do the collection. Now, what happens is you're collecting the natural fungi that feed on the rice, but also that feed on the insect corpses, basically the chitin-feeding chitin insects. Um, so, or, no, I'm sorry, uh, chitin-feeding fungi that feed on the insects. So um, you're kind of capturing all the local equivalents of Bavaria bassiana and Cyceria fumicerase and all these other biocontrols that you're making at home, but you're gathering whatever the local species is from your particular property or your particular region so that when you apply this in your garden, you don't have to worry about you know, contaminating the ground or worry about runoff. You're worried about if your kid's running through the garden while you're spraying or if your dog runs by you. Uh, or if it drinks from the container, it's no big deal. I can drink this stuff, it's, which is cool. So now your, your basket's been out there for five days. You have your nice solid block of fungi. Uh, it's going to be white, maybe a little yellow, maybe a little bit of green in there. But for the most part, it should be white or most, you know, 80% plus white. You're going to take the basket back, uh, and then you're going to take all of your different fungal blocks that you have. Check them, make sure they're not all green. If it's all green, it's gone to trichoderma. Now, trichoderma is good in some cases. If you've got a fungal outbreak or whatever, you can culture that trichoderma and absolutely use that if you have, you know, 50, you know, root rot or some other, you know, powdery mildew, something like that if you have to. But we're not trying to, to collect the tri trichoderma. Trichoderma can be a little too aggressive, and it can wipe out a lot of your other beneficials if you use too much of it. So uh, uh, if it's too much green, throw it away. Um, if it's not all green, it's all nice and white or white and yellow, Take that, and you're going to weigh it all and put all the good collections into a bucket. You know, if you put out 20 of them, you should get at least, you know, seven or eight of them that are keepers. Um, you know, if you get more than that, then great. But, you know, don't feel bad if you only get one or two. That's perfectly fine. That's all you really need. So now you're going to weigh all of that collectively. So let's just say that, that we had uh, three kilograms of it. So we have 3,000 grams that we had uh, saved. Now we're going to weigh 3,000 grams of brown sugar. And we're going to combine that and mix it all together, and it's going to stabilize it by locking out the oxygen with all of that sugar. Um, and that's going to basically cause all of those microbes to go to like a spore form. So now we have a shelf-stabilized version that we can keep indefinitely uh, for, for use as our store, you know, basically shelf-stabilized pesticide that we've just made. Now when we're ready to brew that, we're going to take a big scoopful. Uh, if we're doing a smaller batch, you can do it a tablespoon for, you know, a, a grow tent size. If you're going to do a larger grow, you know, we were doing a, a, you know, a four to six cups of it to do um, about 8,000 square feet of greenhouse. It doesn't take that much. You put that into a big paint strainer. You put an air stone or two in there, and you brew it up in your bucket or in your trash can and uh, uh, brew that up for 24 hours. Now, um, the IPMO should smell freakishly like wintergreen uh, when it finishes. It has this amazing pine wintergreen smell. I can't tell you why. I don't know what. I think it's the phenols that are in it, but um, it, it, it comes out this incredible, like, wintergreen smell. I'm, I'm not sure if that's universal. It's been universal with all the different places I've done it. You might have a version with your local biology that doesn't make it happen, but every time I've done it, that's what it smells like. So now you have this all good brew mix that's basically the rewoken up microbes that you went and collected that feed on chitin. And now, when you apply that either directly to the root system through your fertigation, just strain it and, and apply it right to the roots. Uh, you can also foliar spray it onto the plants, um, and it works to kill a huge wide range of insects, but also uh, instantly provides chitinase directly to the plants because those in, the fungi broke down that chitin from those insects inside of it. So you're also increasing the SAR response of the plants. So the plant's now boosting its immune system and its own defenses and you're directly infecting the, the insects that are on the plant. So it's kind of like a double mechanism. You're boosting the plant's ability to fight the insects uh, and boosting its, its nutrient uptake of calcium uh, at the same time, which also helps with insect resistance. You're also um, directly infecting the, the, the pest insects, you know, 
by applying spores directly to their body, which then infect them and kill them. It turns them into little white mummies, which is really, really cool. But um, it really is the best pesticide that I've seen, or the best innovation I've seen in, in the organic world in a long time. And I think that everybody should be sharing this recipe you know, with anybody they can because it's a completely safe way to make a, a pesticide that really kicks the crap out of just a huge range of different insects. Um, and it's completely safe. You can drink the stuff and it's not, it might give you a stomach ache, but it's not going to kill you. You know, you're not going to have to go to the hospital. There, there's no kind of you know, danger. That's awesome. I appreciate you sharing that recipe with us. We have uh, quite a few folks that take notes. You know, they've got their pen and pad ready and they're, they're taking notes on that. And really with this, this IMO recipe, it's natural farming technique. And there's so many different natural farming techniques out there. But yeah, again, thanks for sharing that one. I've, I'm sure you've probably saved quite a few gardens now in the future here because, uh, like you mentioned, that sounds like it's very strong and very uh, valuable for folks growing in different areas to kind of prevent pests or, or tackle pests. I've even had people um, use it on broad mites and have success as well, which surprised me because I've typically things with six legs do not, or eight legs do not work with with fungal biocontrols. So, um, you know, again, I haven't had that response, but we have, I've had reports of people, two different people in Thailand using it to treat mites. So, um, you know, you never know what you're going to collect and and what it's going to work for, but for the most part, it is amazing for most of your larger insects across the board. What about like storage tips and shelf life on it? So uh, the oldest one I've had is about a year and a half old and it was still pretty viable. Um, I haven't kept it longer than that just because, um, you know, it, it's kind of a newer tech that's only been around really since 2020. So most of the places we're at, we haven't, ch- you know, we've either blown through the whole batch that we made or, um, you know, some other thing where we just combined it with the next one. You can combine multiple months too, right? So I like to do a collection every month and then I'll combine this month, last month, and the next month, you know, from the previous year. So if I collect it in February, I'm going to put January and March's collections in the following year's uh, application and you just combine those three when you make it. So a scoop of this, a scoop of this and a scoop of this, and that's going to give you the best uh, biodiversity. In fact, it's not that much different from, you know, who used to do this first was the Vikings. They would take the, the best soil from the end of the growth season or the, you know, right before harvest, put it into empty ram's horns and seal them with wax and then bury them below the frost line. And then when the spring would come and the ground would thaw, they would dig those up and spread them back out on the, on the ground. Well, they thought they were like, putting the garden spirits back onto the garden. Actually, what they were doing is just inoculating it with microbes that were kept below the frost line. Uh, and then now they're kind of just re-inoculating their garden with the best microbes from the, the previous year. So they had the same kind of idea. It was just a little bit different methodology. So a lot of the stuff is really much older than people realize, or we've been doing similar practices. We just kind of refined them you know, significantly since, uh, since their inception. This clip is brought to you by AC Infinity. Use discount code MrGrowAt15 to save on any of their products.